It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Hello and welcome to Real Egg Radio on this Tuesday, July 11th. As you can probably tell from my voice, it has been a great week. I've had a wonderful time visiting with friends and family, and my voice is a little tired. But what is summer for, if not for late nights and campfires and too much talking? Uh, And I'm known for that. So there you go. All right, today's lineup, really great show. We're going to talk about some of the issues with the port strike happening at Vancouver and some of the issues with perishable goods, including meat being caught in the port strike. We're also going to talk about agrivoltaics and what that even is. Is. We've also got a discussion with Deb Campbell from Agronomy Advantage on the SWAT cam and what that can teach you about your soybean crop. And we've got Cliff and Dale Horst joining us at the end of the show to talk about compaction and preventing compaction on the farm. So stick around for that. If you've got any feedback on today's show, 1-855-776-6147. Or of course, you can find us across social media at Real Agriculture. We'd love to hear from you. All right, let's get to the show. I'll be back right after this. Advanced canola trait technology is here. And it's soon to be the talk of the town. Optimum Gly delivers excellent yield potential and agronomic trait performance. Improved crop safety. Enhanced weed control. And a wider window of application. You're going to want to see this. Learn more at OptimumGly.ca. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio, broadcasting here from Alltech One. We are fortunate now to be joined by the CEO of Alltech. It is Dr. Mark Lyons. Mark, for some of the listeners in Canada and the U.S. that have heard of Alltech but aren't totally familiar with what those products are, talk about that. We focus on how do we deploy sustainable solutions for agriculture. So mainly through nutrition, whether that's crop nutrition or animal nutrition, you know, that's kind of the area that we understand the best. Our background is in microbiology, so we've worked with all sorts of different types of fermentation to produce these types of technologies. But ultimately what we're trying to do is how do we improve the health of that, that animal, that crop, um, end up with something that we're, we're, we're not having to use as many chemical interventions, and we're really aligned with the future and really where consumers are already getting to today and regulators as well. There's so much conversation around sustainability. We've got to be able to measure what we're doing, reduce our impact, but at the same time, produce more nutrition, mm. which is ultimately what, what the population needs. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and joining me now is René Roy. He's the chair of the Canadian Pork Council. Welcome here, René. Hello. All right. So, uh, certainly a, a important thing happening uh, on, at our ports. And even when the strike is over, I think it's an important discussion to have. Uh, but right now, the Canadian Pork Council is drawing attention to the need for, of course, many products to be moving through the port in light of this strike. And pork is one of those. What's, what's at issue here, Renee? Yes, uh, we, uh, pork is a perishable good, and we have a lot of our product that is uh, shipped through uh, the, the uh, British Columbia ports that are going to uh, Asia, notably Japan, as fresh pork. If it stays too long into the containers... Uh, they, it will just go bad because it, has, it, it is a, a product that has a really limited uh, shelf life. And if it's not transported, it will just be wasted, which is, I, I believe, uh, so, uh, on a societal point of view, something that nobody wants. Mm-hmm. So we've certainly heard, you know, about some consumer goods that are caught up in this port strike and that, you know, there may be long waits that happen. But but we're also talking about food here. Now, we know that grain is considered essential and grain movement can't be impacted by a strike. But is the Canadian Port Council asking that any food be considered essential? 
we uh, we have discussed with other groups that are uh, have that have the same kind of concern that we do, and we that's why we are talking about perishable foods. Uh, it's not everything that uh, has such a short shelf life, but meat is certainly one that has uh, such a critical uh, span. So time span. So this is one reason why we are requesting. Uh, as, a, as an option uh, for the government to uh, find a solution. Uh, when there is a strike, we are not saying that uh, labor rights shouldn't be uh, implemented. We, uh, we understand and respect the right of a, a union to do a strike. Our question is how can we avoid uh, products to be wasted? It's not all products that, that are wasted if they, if they wait uh, in the port, but perishable, perishable goods, notably uh, pork meat, is certainly one that we have to consider. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So now, are you? So is the port council asking for a resolution right now, as well as asking for perhaps moving something into legislation, or, or are those two separate asks right now? There, for sure, we wish that this uh, situation. And as soon as possible, uh, we are not in the negotiation, but we believe that uh, trans- uh, transport minister has to be uh, aware of the situation of our communities, agriculture communities uh, at the port. And uh, of course, we, we know that this can take a little bit more time in terms of legislation, but uh, uh, I would say short term. First thing is to make sure that our products can move uh, to uh, the, its final destination, and in the medium term, uh, our proposition is that there is a modification so that uh, it is considered as a product that has to move and mm-hmm. cannot be uh, stopped during a strike. Mm-hmm. Which we have, we've certainly seen before. Now, thinking more broadly, um, you know, we've certainly heard about some challenges within the pork industry as well. Uh, how significant is a strike like this, or or the stoppage of movement of pork product how you know how challenging is that for the pork industry with our export partners are, how concerned are you uh, we are concerned we are we are highly concerned uh, we if we cannot ship it reduces to our to our customers uh, other uh, in other countries it reduces our reliability as a business partner and we know that Right now, there is plenty of pork that could be uh, consumed from other countries. So if we don't uh, honor our uh, contracts with, uh, our, uh, with our consumers, they will look around and will we'll look for other reliable uh, source of the supply. So we are concerned and we've gone through years that have been really tough for our, in- for our industry. Uh, yes, it has been at the uh, world level, but we shouldn't add weight to our industry when it has gone through such hardship. Mm-hmm. Now, so the Canadian Pork Council, as well as the Canada Meat Council, of course, bringing light to to this issue. Uh, is this something, you know, you're having discussions at a provincial level as well as federal, or are you focused solely at the federal level? We had some discussion with our provincial pork organizations at other levels, at the provincial level, but uh, we know that port is at the uh, is a federal jurisdiction. So uh, we want to look at the the, uh, the situation at a, a federal level. We have seen other strikes that has affected the movement of our products, considering that we ship about seventy percent of our pork to other countries. It is really important that we have a logistical uh, chain that is working well and is not affected uh, regularly by various Mm -hmm. challenges that reduces the reliability of our industry to to, uh, ship or supply our customers. 
Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Renee, thank you so much for, you know, this is definitely something that we often, when we think of port, we think about bulk shipments of grain, uh, but this is certainly container traffic and very much, of course, uh, a food that is not moving. So thank you so much for bringing this to our attention uh, and we'll be keeping track. So thank you so much, Renee. Thank you, Lindsay. All right. We'll be back with more Real Ag Radio right after this. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of the Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, on the Soybean School, we'll bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by Pride Seeds, BASF, and Syngenta Canada. Welcome back to Real Egg Radio. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. And joining me now on the line is Patrick Gossage. He's with Agrivoltaics Canada. And Patrick, what the heck is Agrivoltaics? Hi, Lindsay. Nice to connect with you. And uh, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, Agrivoltaics is a overly technical sounding term for what is actually a very simple concept, which is the dual use of solar photovoltaic panels, which is where the, the voltaics comes from in the agrivoltaics, um, and some form of, of farming practice. Um, so not uh, taking out farms by putting as many conventional solar modules as you can on the farms, but rather working with agriculture in a symbiotic complementary fashion um, so as to augment the, the farm uh, operation diversify income for farmers. Um, and there's a host of uh, other symbiotic relationships um, such as more efficient water use, um, uh, sh shade for uh, solar sheep um, or sh solar grazing, I should say, um, whether that's sheep or cattle or other for forms of, uh, of grazing um, that you know very well. And it was mm -hmm. great to connect with you yesterday uh, and see your operation. Um, so it can form a number of different uh, permutations and, and combinations. We've even, um, I've got firsthand experience um, doing agrivoltaics with, with crop growth in greenhouses. Um, there's uh, vertical farming uses. So um, as we go, get more into controlled environmental agriculture, um, using solar to power those increasingly energy intensive uh, forms of agriculture. There's a, there's a host of different permutations, but simply put, it's just the dual use of solar on farms. Okay, so now, so Patrick, you're based in the Toronto area and I, it actually has taken a little bit for me to even, you know, find out that there was an Agrivoltex Canada, but I can be forgiven apparently because it is quite new. So it's brand new. yeah, it's brand new. So we're going to dig in a, a bit more on how agrivoltaics works. And of course, um, I can share some of my experience, but I, I really want to know sort of what is agrivoltaics Canada and why, what sort of drove you to put this together? So we've been a, a working group, uh, a pan Canadian working group spanning from British Columbia through Alberta um, and in Ontario um, and uh, anchored with uh, Western University and in particular. Dr. Pierce at Western University, who's been um, the, the most widely cited, as, as I can tell, um, professor uh, on this concept of agrivoltaics over the last 12 years. Um, we were a, a group of enthusiasts, um, and uh, I, can I can go into the backstory of how I fell into it, but uh, a group of enthusiasts that just saw this as a pragmatic approach to keep farmers farming. Um, and diversify their income, as mentioned, uh, as, as core to the concept. 
Um, so we, we started just having weekly working group meetings, sharing some of the projects that we were focused on and sharing some of the different ways that we thought this could work. Um, started getting interest from government. Uh, there's an, a number of reasons why this is extremely politically palatable um, in ways that it can sort of bridge the rural urban divide, um, you know, food security, energy security, all those things. And we're seeing that um, in the US right now um, with some bipartisan um, agreements on this, uh, which is remarkable given the, the divide in the US right now. Um, and uh, as government started to, to um, take an interest in what we were doing, uh, we just recognized the need to incorporate. Um, it, it was There was a directive from them that um, if we wanna speak in an official capacity and start to influence policy and push for the greater proliferation of agrophotics across Canada, uh, we need to incorporate. So we incorporated as a industry body, not-for-profit just over a month ago, um, but we have uh, some infrastructure in place and um, and there's certainly a groundswell of interest in this. Um, and it was, yeah, great. Again, just great to be a part of your event yesterday and, and only served to further the excitement and the feeling from my side that we're we're in the right space at the right time and, and there's there's a real need for this right and so to fill everybody in you and i actually did get to meet in person so you did come to the solar site that uh we graze so our our farm uh with sheep and so we've been there six years and so we're happy to host a group um it's been really nice i will say we did a few tours before covid but of course those all stopped during covid and it was a, a bit lonely for a couple summers i'll be honest so it's great to have everybody coming back um it was a, a fabulous contingent uh some members from the toronto area people from um, uh, the the states as well coming up and and this is something that so what's interesting to me is that from our perspective you know we know that that solar grazing as we call it which is a part of agrivoltaics um you know it is quite new but it is catching on you know here in canada somewhat but absolutely being adopted in the u.s um i think much For sure. much quicker um and but you know, as we started in this journey of, you know, it just made sense to us to be able to sort of bring the farming back to a solar farm. Um, but, you know, as we get into this, we start to realize that, yeah, there's the opportunity to potentially grow vegetables under these panels or in conjunction with these panels or uh, different crop types or, you know, even the very basics of just making hay in between the panels um, is it's quite a remarkable way to make really efficient use of the same land base and so um and and we face a lot of pushback on that so i i guess and from the agricultural industry i mean to be perfectly frank there's a lot of people out there who see solar as using farmland and taking it out of production and mm -hmm. so we we field those questions quite a bit what is your experience i mean obviously you're coming from the industry side the academic side bringing that together uh connecting now the, the three components of this, the agriculture side as well. Have you, do you field a lot of those questions as well as like, you know, this will never work or you're using up valuable farmland? What is sort of the, the pushback you get at times when talking about agrivoltaics? Yeah, of, of course, um, you know, and um, we have to understand the, the context. And I think the context um, is very situational, um, very, very regional as well. I mean, if we just take the Ontario context, there's good reason why there would be farmer pushback. Um, the Ontario context, we had a feed-in tariff that was that was very, very lucrative, um, much more lucrative than traditional farming. Um, when, when the feed-in tariff was first posted back in 2009, I think it was, um, we over-incentivized the solar market and took you know, large swaths of premium farmland in southwestern Ontario out of production um, and covered them with, with solar panels. Um, and the result in that was, you know, quite rightly that there was a moratorium put on building solar in Ontario as a result of uh, the, the counterweight to the over incentivization of, of solar in Ontario. So that's the context in Ontario. It makes sense. Um, but now what we're saying is the costs of solar has come down 90% um, since we needed to incentivize solar back then. Um, so 
uh, it's a, it's a different um, there's different dyna economic dynamics at play. We don't have a feed-in tariff anymore. Solar is now the cheapest new form of uh, energy production, um, as cited by the International Energy Agen Agency. Um, so it, it's a, it's a different game, and and we've uh, as a result um, come up with different ways and. Uh, different ways to design and build these projects that can incorporate and, in fact, complement and enhance agriculture. We're actually seeing uh, crop yields improve, water retention improve, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, under certain configurations. And that's what's exciting about this. It, you know, it's, it's, it is early days, um, but, um, you know, we did this project uh, with Helene um, using their solar modules in 2019, um, greenhouse integrated solar modules. So in, in, if you can picture, instead of using a conventional module that has maximized the number of cells on it, um, we used about a third the number of cells and a frameless module. And we retrofit those modules into a, a greenhouse. So uh, taking the existing glass out and, and replacing it with these modules and studied, we had Niagara College study the potted basil plants um, for, um, for several quarters um, following this installation. And we found that the potted basil grew more densely because the, the solar, the diffused solar glass penetrated into the basil plant um, uh, better than the conventional glass and uh, grew a more dense potted basil plant. So it, you know, change, is hard. Um, anytime you're rethinking a, a traditional practice that um, has, you know, has been done for a number of years, it's it's hard, and and it should be hard to convince people. Uh, and this is the role of Agrivoltaics Canada is is to aggregate data, case studies from across the globe and and across Canada, start to get pilot projects uh, in the ground where we're actually demonstrating having third party um, data collectors uh, corroborate that this is actually working. Um, get the disseminate the information. Start communicating that this can work uh, to to farmers, to government policymakers, and just the wider public um, mm -hmm. to get to get some groundswell around this. Because you know, I'm I, I'm not the innovator. I'm just a pragmatist. I I would not have thought that this. You know, I didn't think that this was going to work. When I led the uh, Helene project in 2019, I really wasn't sure it was going to work, and was astonished to, to find that it did. Uh, and uh, and now I'm just a pragmatist who wants to get the message out there. Well, and and you know to speak to that further from our experience here. So we're in the Ottawa Valley. We are we our farm is on one of the very first of those sites that you mentioned that went in on very good farm ground. And sure. you know my partner and I, Chris, we we both were pretty we would have been in the camp of why are you putting panels on good farmland it of should course. be farmland and you know it was a big but when you look at these sites you realize you know there's still plenty of space under there where lots grows and this is one of the main pushback that we often get is well nothing grows under those panels which is patently false um yep. lots grows under these panels uh the yep. if they're especially if they're a fixed panel the earth rotates you see and so as it does that um where the sunlight goes changes but we've we've seen anecdotally and this is why i'm excited obviously i'm i'm biased on this one everybody i'm just going to put that out there uh but we've seen in action the impact of that shade not just on our livestock in that our sheep on hot days are always under those panels in the cool grass in the shade uh, but we've seen a significant difference in those really hot July, August, those, those dry stretches. Um, the grass growth is green and abundant under the panels when it's burnt up and dried out in between. And we've seen just what and and in being part of so so there is something and i've i've shared it here on real ag radio before uh the american solar grazers association has brought together uh, people who are who are grazing these sites as well and we're seeing you know out of australia out of california and this is just on the grazing side where in even very dry climates the the, the integration of solar onto grazing land is actually increasing the grass production and the, and the plant production so uh, it's really encouraging to know that the the science is sort of 
catching up with what we're already sort of figuring out. Um, but yep. I, I'm, I am fascinated to learn, you know, we have the experience on the grazing side and, and we already see where, you know, it really does bring farming back to the same land and is, it, it's an incredible thing to be able to capture energy as well as make food and fiber on the same acre as well as create biodiversity and, and keep habitat. Um, going. I mean, our, our site is 200 acres that we're on or one of the sites we're on and it is, well, you walked through it. It is, yeah, it's impressive. full of blooming flowers and butterflies and spiders and praying mantis and all these sorts of things when, you know, so it, it is alive under there. Absolutely. You, I go you ahead. Explained, you explained to me yesterday, which I didn't know that not every bug is a bug. When you had a bug land. <laughs> it's true. No idea. <laughs> Every bug is an insect, but not all insects are bugs. So there you go. It's true. So it's, you know, we've seen it firsthand, but it's it's really neat to think about what else could we be doing and integrating solar. And as you mentioned, the the setting up a solar panel or a solar uh, power array, the cost has come down significantly. So, you know, knowing now or learning about potentially, you know, the water efficiency advantage of growing under a panel um then we start to look at like vegetable production and even crop production like to me it's just there yes we need the science to show us yes it does this and and yes it does this with you know certainty but from what i've seen on the grazing side it just makes so much sense for all sorts of reasons and we already have i guess this is my I know there's new sites being built and there's new ways that we can integrate solar, like you've said, with greenhouses or those sorts of things. But there's also there's also solar that exists already that we could be doing more of this with without having to get super creative in how we change the setup. So like the, to, to me, that's super exciting. A hundred percent. Yeah, um, I, I think there's a lot that can be done with existing sites, as you've you know beautifully proven. And, and then, yeah, again, just to reiterate, you know, huge amounts of biodiversity pollinator program on on your site um and it was it was thriving there was there was a lot going on in that ecosystem um but yeah and, and you know to, to your point there's there's lots of shade tolerant um fruits and vegetables um we're seeing a lot of interest from the raspberry community um that has a greater degree of shade tolerance um and increasingly we're, we're seeing um, the eagerness to use solar just as forms of, of protection. I think the, the old way of thinking was, you know, you need maximal light, uh, you know, micromole in equal, equals uh, micromole of growth, something to that effect. Um, and now with, with climate change, with wilder, wetter um, weather that we're getting, uh, certainly in Ontario, um, we're seeing solar as a means to protect from from uh, wild weather events such as hailstorms, um, high heat days. You know, mm -hmm. actually protecting the crops from uh, overexposure to to heat and and um, creating these microclimates that are cooler, um, like you like you saw with the grass uh, growing better in um, high heat conditions. Um, so. Uh, there's just a paradigm shift in the thinking that's that's happening now and and i think that's really exciting and um we just need to capitalize on this movement that's part of what agrivoltaics canada needs to do uh is, is just communicate um start to get this information out there i very much appreciate you having me on the show today lindsay and um no doubt we're, we're going to return the favor once we get our uh, agrivoltaics canada communications team up and running I'm, I'm sure we'll have you uh on one of our web webinars uh early on once we get our comms team uh, up and running Thank yeah, you. so it, it is new. Yeah, no. And and one thing I did want to say, so anyone, uh, there is a website up. I did go check that out. Um, but one of my questions to you yesterday was, okay, so are you going to have an event? Because this is one thing that, you know, and the comm size is so important, you know, uh, uh, even just sharing that this is happening, it's still a very, very new thing. Most people have not heard about either solar grazing or growing vegetables in conjunction with a power site or those sort of things. So, um, I, I know that you said there was an event last year. Uh, yep. Is that in the plan again for this year? Will this be an annual thing? Hundred percent. Yeah. It, it's it's uh, so um, it's through the Ivy School at Western University, 
Um, we were actually talking about it on our weekly call yesterday, and we're planning on um, doubling in size this year. So we had about 100 people last year. Um, it's free for farmers to attend. Uh, and um, we, yeah, we're in the midst of working on our, our speaker schedule and, and planning the event. Um, but it will focus on existing case studies, um, existing policy, technology, um, all those things. Um, and also attended, they've got a great, that's called the Solar Farm Summit. Um, that's the US version. Um, I attended that in Chicago this past March. It was the first one. So we actually, Canada beat the US for the punch <laughs> yes. on the conference run. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't quite have the same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we didn't have quite the same numbers, but we did uh, get ours in before them. Um, but yeah, there was there was a huge amount of excitement uh, at the Chicago event. Um, and Dan French down there has been doing a great job mm-hmm. uh, in building excitement and, and, and collaboration. There's a lot of eagerness to collaborate on this stuff. Um, you know, it involves, I mentioned the, the, you know, not the permutations in terms of different designs using different technology techniques. Um, so there's a real eagerness to, to collaborate and, and share experiences, share regional experiences, um, you know, with different types of agriculture and in, in, in different regions. So mm-hmm. it's very exciting. It is. All right. I'll put it on the calendar. I think you said December. Is that when? Yeah, it, we don't. We yeah. we don't have an exact date. Don't have a but, date, uh, but end uh, of the year, we'll, we'll say. Yeah, it'll be yeah. Early, the first week, first or second week in December, and I'll like to. All right. I'll mark it down. All right, Patrick. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Appreciate it, and keep doing what you're doing. All right, I'll be back with more Real Egg Radio right after this. Infuse some energy into your next corporate event, customer meeting, or conference with Real Ag Radio, Canada's national agriculture radio show. Create a unique experience at your next event with host Sean Haney, broadcasting Real Ag Radio live on Sirius XM, featuring exciting guests, captivating interviews, and the latest news from the agriculture community. Contact advertising at realagriculture.com or call 587-787-1795 to book your on location with Real Ag Radio today. If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. Peter Johnson at WheatPeakRealAgriculture.com. I'm the host of The Word, and I love doing The Word. I love the questions. I love the challenges. I love having to apply agronomics to all over the globe and areas outside of my normal jurisdiction. Also, I love the feedback the most where growers challenge me, tell me about their plot results, help me to learn. The Word, absolutely the best part of my day. Welcome back to Real Egg Radio, and this segment is brought to you by the Canadian Beef Industry Conference. It's being held at the BMO Centre on Stampede Park in Calgary, Alberta, from August 15th to 17th. Join us. Proud, innovative, and loyal, we are beef. Build your network through the speakers, trade show, and entertainment. Visit CanadianBeefIndustryConference.com for full details and to register today. All right, I am your host for the day, Lindsay Smith. And for this segment, we head over to Ontario and we meet with Deb Campbell from Agronomy Advantage and Mr. Byrne Tobin, of course, here with Real Agriculture. And we're going to talk about the SWAT CAM, the Soil, Water and Topography CAM and what it can teach you about your field. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Soybean School today. I'm in Grand Valley, Ontario, catching up with Deb Campbell from Agronomy Advantage. Deb, how's it going? Good, Bern. It's good to see you. Awesome. And a beautiful day. And hey, we are going to look at SWAT cam today. And Deb, tell us what we're looking at here. Uh, I see cameras mounted on a sprayer broom headed down the field, you know, capable of taking images and counting plants. Am I close? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So the SWAT cams are literally cameras that are mounted on the booms of sprayers. But what's a little bit different with these is that 
we're capturing images to be able to make crop management decisions, you know, um, based on biomass, based on, um, you know, plant counts, uh, those sorts of things. It's, it's not necessarily a spraying uh, piece, even though they're mounted on the sprayer. So it's a little bit different that way. Awesome. Now, in recent years, we've heard a lot about, you know, SWAT maps, um, soil, water, and topography maps. And here we have a SWAT cam. Talk about, I guess, how these two sort of synchronize and go together to manage those zones you're talking about. Right, so the foundational piece is SWAT maps. So, you know, we're in a soybean field here today. It's been SWAT mapped. Um, you know, we do variable rate fertilizer on this farm. Uh, we do variable rate seeding on this farm, trying to match the conditions of the soil to the plant growth that we're intending to get. So now this final piece is coming in with the SWAT cam. So my scouting crew has been in here and taken all kinds of different uh, population counts. Um, but this camera, it'll be interesting to see what sort of population counts it comes back with. And of course, in 2023, we've had such a dry spring. We've had variable emergence. You know, it's quite challenging. And, you know, even here today, there's still soybeans emerging and popping up. So it'll be interesting to see what the cams tell us about the emergence, the population, the stand count versus what my scouts are seeing yeah. when they're out here. Now tell us about the technology here and the data um, and the imagery that you're going to get from the cam. You know, how does, how does that sort of download and compile information that you can use? Yeah, well, it's, it's really simple that, um, you know, basically the imagery shows up on an app on your phone or your desktop. And um, so we, we get a report that tells us, you know, sort of a biomass, um, you know, based on canopy cover. Uh, we can distinguish between crop versus other species. So, you know, that we can um, maybe not necessarily identify every weed, but we can distinguish the crop from them. Um, and then we also get percent cover, plant cover by zone, again, so that we can tie it back to what our seeding rates were, what our fertility plans were according to our swap maps. So uh, several different data layer pieces there. It's really intriguing in that the picture quality is so good, you can actually zoom in and identify weeds on a lot of them. So it's, I'm not replacing the scouting yet, but it's really neat that it has that quality of a picture. Now, how much work here is there for the operator? You've got two cameras here. Um, is it pretty much push button? Actually, it's not even push button. It's turn on the key. <laughs> so these are mounted on each wing of the boom. Um, you know, we try to get equal spacing or close to it. And as soon as, you know, they're, they're powered to the key, as soon as you turn on the machine, they're, they're going. And as soon as a, a sprayer t pulls into a SWAT map field, covers that, crosses that boundary line, it picks up that it should be recording and away it goes. The operator doesn't have to do anything. You know, there's a little bit of work to just keep an eye on it, make sure everything's operating, keep the dust off the, the screens, that sort of thing. But no, it's been pretty seamless and easy to operate. So Deb, tell me about, I guess, the data you're capturing this year. How, how are you gonna apply it to this year's crop and in managing future crops? Well, so far, you know, we're, we're here in, in June in the weed control window. Um, so a lot of it has mostly just been monitoring and um, it, taking those emergence counts. So that feedback to the, the planter, that feedback to the uh, air seeder to indicate how well the emergence is by zone. Um, I anticipate we've done a few nitrogen applications based on zone and the percent cover, particularly in cereals, so nitrogen um, management. And, you know, I actually anticipate we'll be able to use these in fungicide management as well, that we can pick up, you know, have those zones of high biomass where they're a much higher risk perhaps of white mold, and we can have either an on-off script or a, a low rate and a high rate type of script to address the spatial difference in, in the canopy. And then, you know, there's always for plans for next year in, in you know, are, are the uh, seed mortality by zone too much, right. you know? So do we need to increase some of those zones, the seeding rate to match the productivity of a zone? So, to, so there's lots of different ways to, 
use this in the future to right size and correct and, and improve our, our scripts. Now you're working with a number of your clients this year with uh, the SWAT camp. How's it been going and, and where do you see this five years from now? Is it going to put you out of business <laughs> or is that, and how is it going to change agronomy? <laughs> Well, it's it's quite fascinating, you know, when you can sit at your desk and actually identify weeds across a field. Um, you know, that has a, a lot of, um, that impresses me in that, you know, maybe there will be a point in the future where this sort of technology would replace, uh, you know, full-on scouting for, um, for insects or diseases or weeds sort of thing. And, but, you know, really right now, you know, my, my crew takes a lot of time doing stand counts, stand counts, stand counts. And my expectation is that this is in the near future is going to be replacing that exercise very, very nicely and far more accurately. Um, you know, so there's, there's a spot there. And, and, you know, that's the thing with technology is you just don't know what you can do until you get at it and experience and then see how it unravels. So yeah, we'll see how it turns out. Well, Deb, hey, thank you uh, for making time for the Soybean School. Always great to have you on Real, Real Agriculture. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Bern. It was fun. All right, big thanks to Bern and to Deb for joining us here on the show. Bern's actually going to be back. You'll hear him in the next segment coming up. We are going to talk all about compaction and about how uh, two brothers are tackling compaction on their farm in Ontario. We'll be back with more right after this. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. As you head out into the field this season, the Corn School's got you covered. Everything from tillage discussions, weed control info, field trial results, yield strategies, and more. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio on this Tuesday, July 11th. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and this segment is brought to you by Alpine. Making the most efficient use of your dollars spent on crop nutrition is a constant goal of farmers. Alpine recognizes this hurdle, trying to bring about economic balance with ever-changing environmental conditions. Alpine developed the Maximizing Fertilizer Efficiency Program to solve this yearly dilemma. The program's goal is to reduce risk from variable weather conditions by managing the nutritional requirements for the crop in a timely manner. To learn more, contact Alpine at 1-800-265-2268 today. All right, we are into our final segment. And for this one, as promised, Bern Tobin joined us just briefly um, as we head to speak with Cliff and Dale Horst. They are farmers in Ontario. And we dig in, this is an episode of The Soil School, we dig in to how these brothers are tackling the impact of compaction on their farm. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to The Sharp Edge. Today, I'm down in Perth County with Adam Parker, Mazix agronomist. Adam, how's it going? Very well. Yourself, Bern? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. Now, we are here on the farm with Cliff Horst, who runs Country Custom Ag. So, Adam, why is Cliff on The Sharp Edge? So, Cliff and his partners have some highly productive ground here in Perth County, and in doing so, they have some opportunities to maximize their yields, but they also need to cover a lot of acres in a short period of time in the spring. So they're forced with getting a lot of corn acres done and being able to optimize yield and productivity in their business as well. So Cliff and his uh, partners have been able to develop a planter that works very well for their system, which brings a lot of capacity to the field, but also mitigates a lot of compaction and allows the crop to grow evenly and productively. So it's been uh, a really good fit for their business. Well, here's Cliff Horst. So Cliff, tell me about your operation. Okay, Country Custom Ag is a company that owns farm equipment that provides a service to myself and my brother Dale and also to other local farmers in the area uh, in Perth County and uh, Oxford. 
So today we're going to discuss and dive into your corn planter a little bit. Can you tell us about your corn planter and some of the, the details around it? Yes, uh, this is the third season for the corn planter. We purchase it as a good used unit and uh, it's a 24 row harvest international. We pull it with a Fent 1038 and uh, the reason behind it we wanted to have something with a lot of carrying capacity as far as nitrogen, seed and starter and uh, we're able to actually skip a farm when we're tendering the planter so we can carry enough to do 100 acres. So Cliff can you tell us about a, a normal spring day when you get started with that corn planter? Okay well first of all there's never a normal day but anyhow. <laughs> uh, ideally and this has been very efficient for us. Uh, you know, we can leave the shop loaded with a planter, go to a field or farm, plant 100 acres, have the tender unit move to the next farm, fill there, plant that farm, fill again, and actually move on to your third farm for the day. And the tender unit then has to go to the fifth farm for the day. So it's been very, very efficient for us from a labor perspective, from a time perspective. It has increased our acres per day substantially. And meanwhile, you've been able to mitigate that with this tire inflation system. That is right. And, you know, Mazex has done our stand audits and we've done yield tests and they've just proven to us that we made the right decision. So can you tell about some of the specifics as far as the capacity of the planter? Yes, so we can carry 1,600 gallons of 28% uh, nitrogen, UEN, 550 gallons of starter on the tractor, and then it's also uh, central commodity tanks on the plant to proceed. So when you, uh, you're talking about all that on a 24-row planter, you're, you're starting to add up to a lot of weight. Can you talk about some of the, either some of the capacities or the, the, the axle loads and, and then get into the tires and what we're looking at on the, keeping this thing afloat? Yes, I can. Uh, some pretty scary numbers actually when I think about planter. I almost don't like to hear them. But uh, the planter, when it's fully loaded, we're about 40 ton total weight, tractor and planter. And you're carrying that on three axles? We're carrying that on three axles, yes. Front of the tractor carries the starter, 550 gallons in the front of the tractor, and then uh, the planter has the 1600 gallon UEN tank and the seed tanks. Can you talk about the tires that uh, you have uh, for this beast? Yes, so we have uh, um, VF tires on the front of the tractor. They're a 710 60R38. The rear of the tractor is a single tire. It's a 965R46. And then the uh, planter, this is where it becomes quite unconventional, is we have no, we don't have pinch rolls. We rather pack down a whole area, I guess, and run at much lower PSI. And they are a 622.5 rim uh, radial tire. And you're running an air inflation system on, on all three axles, is that correct? That is correct. Front of the tractor, we run at uh, 13 PSI, rear of the tractor at 10 PSI, and the planter at 17. So that's in the field, and when you go to do road travel, do you travel with the planter full? Yes, we do. And what would you run it uh, for a PSI on the road? 60 PSI in the planter, and uh, 25 to 30 in the rear of the tractor, and about 30 in the front. And as far as those parameters, how did you determine them and how do you set those? Basically running as low as the tire manufacturer recommends for those loads. And do you just have set parameters that you can go to manually in your cab or do you have an automatic system? No, we go manually in our cab. So when you look at the planter, is there anything else on the planter that you have to help adjust your weight? Yes, there's also a wing transfer system. It actually transfers the weight to the wings when you're planting in the field. What do you see as the main benefits that this whole uh, system with the air inflation and the radial tires, what, is it, what, what benefits does that bring to your operation? Well, I think what it does is uh, it allows us to carry these weights without any pinch row effect. Um, we have done studies with Mazex the last two years and we have found no difference in emergence or yield um, in the last two years. 
So you're comparing the center frame, center 12 rows versus the wing 12 rows. Uh, you're seeing no yield difference uh, at harvest. We actually compare the center six rows because that's the center six rows are pretty much all tracked. Do you run tracks on your other equipment? Can you talk about the differences or the benefits you see between uh, these large rotation tires with the air system and tracks? Yes, um, tracks are great in the field. We run tracks on our combines, grain buggy has tracks. But uh, if you want to run loaded on the road, uh, tire inflation system is by far superior. You can push the PSI up on that tire and just run down the road like normal. And can you talk a little bit about the way that the, the lift system on the axle allows you to accommodate wider tires compared to some other brands? Yes, so on this frame, the Harvest International frame, the tires are lift in front of the row units rather than between. And that's what allows you to go with a 24 inch wide tire. So Cliff, you've been doing this for three years now with this planter. What are the overall net benefits to your operation and what would you uh, or say is next steps? Well, definitely one of the huge benefits has been efficiencies. And I personally feel we don't have any pinch roll effect because it's not a conventional pinch roll planter in that sense. And the next steps is probably like I mentioned before, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to see an automatic system on the planter that adjusts the pressure as the weight varies on the planter. I think that would be ideal. That would take it to the next, to the next level. So there you have it. Some great insights from Cliff Horst. Adam, um, a lot of growers wrestle with pinch rows. Um, you know, Cliff really has a nice approach here. Yeah, so there's ability to distribute that weight across a wide tire track, both on the planter frame and on the tractor, allow them to distribute, distribute that weight across multiple rows rather than trying to consolidate their weight in between the rows. So it's, uh, it's really allowed him to optimize his tire pressures and uh, do a really good job on getting that, uh, alleviating that compaction. Yeah, and the other thing here is, is the mass, right? 40 tons. Um, uh, you need a strategy to handle that, you know, movement across the field. Yeah, so that's the constraint that they have. They try to maximize their planter fills and productivity, which comes with, at the end of the day, about 40 tons of, of weight across three axles. So the only way you can do that is to get wider and longer. So they've really been able to maximize their tire pressures, their tire size, the right technology on the tires to make sure that they're not uh, damaging the soil and ultimately growing some high, uh, highly yielding corn. Awesome. Hey, another great episode of the Sharp Edge. Thank you for taking the time, sir. We will see you next time. And with that, we wrap up the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for putting up with my very tired voice. Uh, but what is summer for if not to talk way too much with lots of visits and all sorts of fun things. I will be back uh, next week for Tuesdays with Lindsay, of course. But Friday, we have a very special show coming up. Uh, and so there won't be an issues panel. So make sure you come back and check that out on Friday. As always, you can find us across social media at Real Agriculture. And you can let us know what you listen to the show. If you've got any feedback, questions, all those sorts of good things, just let us know. You can call that Real Ag feedback line 1-855-776-6147. Until next time, cheers everybody.